Good morning, good afternoon, good evening all over the world. Dobson 777 Alpha here. All right, these are some of my favorite kind of videos where I'm going to try to force you to use your big brain. I'm going to force you to try to see past what people are telling you and to try to use data to analyze and to make rational decisions because I haven't believed my eyes on what I've seen and we're going to talk about silver. And I just uh, I just did a Google search on silver and went and looked at images just uh, to start this with. But, you know, silver has gone up and I got all these people saying, I told you so, I told you so. Well, no, you don't understand. Again, we have another form of manipulation and it's not real what we're seeing. And I'm going to show you some data why I think that's the case. And I think you're potentially setting yourself up for a horrible uh, problem in the near term. I don't think this is a long term. As I've shown with GameStop and uh, I actually said GameStop that time instead of GameStock like I had been saying. It drives me crazy. And then also uh, AMC, um, you know, these are people out there manipulating for their own gains and a lot of people are getting caught up getting killed in this game because you got to be pretty sophisticated to play. So let me show you what I've uh, been looking at. I started this yesterday and I lost all my dang charts because I just didn't want to do two videos in one day. So I've started all over again. So this is fresh information for you. So the first chart is just throwing a bunch of stuff together. So we got uh, platinum on the bottom, we got uh, uh, S&P 500, and this is since the beginning of the bull runs, that, which started about September 2018, the most recent bull run. Uh, we've got gold, we've got silver, and then large silver miners and uh, large gold miners. The Only the most astute people would pick up what I'm about to focus on because if you look at this, something is not right. Something doesn't fit. Something's unusual. So let's go through each one and I'll explain uh, why there's a problem here and why I think uh, something dramatic is about to happen and a lot of people are going to be uh, screwed. So if we, if we take just these three by themselves, this is just another view of the same time period but just getting rid of the rest of the noise. Uh, we can see platinum's up 46%, but you can see the slope of platinum is very sharp here. We, we've had a recent pullback here, but it's been very sharp compared to even gold. It had to play catch up to gold. And then uh, silver did this uh, magnificent jump here, uh, out of characteristic. Normally you will see just a silver catch up and then ride even, just like you've seen here. It'll just catch up and then it'll fall down, they'll catch up and fall on, but rarely to ever jump up like this. So this is something that you should be aware of, that something isn't right. Remember, silver is extremely plentiful. It's uh, not rare compared to gold and platinum and everything. And so to see this kind of change, you know that something else is going on. And this is kind of related to the Reddit group stuff. So the normal characteristics of uh, physical versus miners, and like the gold, large gold miners, you see about a two times change in relationship. And you'll notice how this is uh, holding up very nicely. It's very close to two times change. Now, normally the junior miners would also be um, like maybe three times and then the explorers would be like four times, but they've really screwed up the ETFs recently because they've intermingled all of these and you don't have pure junior, you don't have pure explorers anymore. It's an amalgam of everything. So those don't even really work anymore. So all you can really do is stick with the large gold miners and then go buy micro and junior miners individually and I'll show those in a minute. So here is um, gold, large gold miners and then royalties which you can see royalties are so over this same time period we've got gold is 46 percent then 72 percent and uh, and then Franco Nevada is 117 percent and that's a, a um, royalty company but then we've got some of our micro miners. We had VNNHF, which is now BSXGF, that's 252%, and then CXBMF, Calibra Mining, 270%. So that kind of shows the uh, leverage that we're trying to get when we move up into these things. But these are extremely high volatility in comparison, so a little dabble, do you? So let's move over to the silver side. All right, so again, uh, this is where we have a problem. 
starting at the same time period, September, you can see silver's at 97%, but large silver miners are showing zero leverage. And this is, this is really unacceptable. It's telling you that there's a problem with this particular data. The, the data has been corrupted by something, and it's a form of manipulation that's occurred here. So when we add in the um, uh, miners, so we have First Majestic and we have uh, MAG, these are silver miners, and you can see the leverage is there, but the uh, large silver miners has no leverage. This silver really should be down here in the 45 to 50%. That would be the appropriate. So I would say uh, silver has a potential to drop pretty dramatically, pretty fast, as soon as everybody loses interest in what they're trying to do uh, in kind of like a short squeeze. So I would argue, be real careful with this. A lot of less sophisticated investors have gone in and buy, bought silver at horrible, horrible premiums, 30, 50%. And I see these guys that are selling silver. They're the big names on there. They're all over there pushing this, this group to keep doing what they're doing because they are making a killing. So don't be dumb, folks. Don't be out there dumb. You're going to get slaughtered. They're just this is lambs being brought to the slaughter, just like AMC and GME that I've talked about the last couple of days. So I want I just want you to see with data how things work, and uh, make sure you understand this is not real. This is not where it belongs. It's going to uh, it's going to revert back, uh, no doubt in my mind. All right, I thought I ought to do an update on. Uh, AMMPF or Ampower. Uh, that's the over the counter is AMMPF. Anybody that's in uh, Canada, you can just buy the AMMP. Uh, I don't know what this is, France 601A, whatever that is, but uh, the over the counter is what uh, I'm going to be showing in my presentations. But in any event, uh, from when I announced this, uh, it's already up uh, 19% in just a couple days, so it's pretty interesting. As I mentioned previously, uh, this is uh, not only a miner, but it's also uh, moving into ammonia production. It, it kind of uh, caught my eye for the sense that I think that um, energy is something we should always be considering. And I like to get in the ground floor of things that uh, could potentially, in this case, you're just, you're making uh, fuel from uh, very simple components. Uh, there's no, none of this drilling, you know, miles and miles and miles into the ocean or into rock and everything else. This is actually quite uh, simple. And I, to me, simple is the most powerful concept for uh, investing. If you can understand this, you've got something that uh, you can get there. So I've been digging into this uh, the last day or so. And uh, let's go through a couple of the things that I found because first thing I was trying to figure out, you know, okay, how, how does this work in like an engine? Uh, we'll get into actual manufacturing of uh, uh, this ammonia as well, but let, let's look at, you know, what, how does this work in an engine? Because I was like, can I go ahead and just hook this up right up to my current engine and, and get the appropriate uh, mileage and everything? Well, unfortunately, no, with the current uh, engine construction that we have. Uh, this has, uh, say, roughly half the, um, the energy uh, because it, it's a very high octane, so you really need to change the engine to compensate for the high octane to get the uh, appropriate amount of energy out of it. But uh, right now, uh, you, it's, it's relatively inexpensive to manufacture, and uh, uh, when they modify the engines to run on this, and then they actually get uh, the fuel at the appropriate locations, there's a lot of benefits to this uh, it's, it's kind of like the hydrogen dream is now potentially going to come to fruition. Uh, I talked about this before, you know, the transport of this is closer to what you do with, uh, say, propane. Hydrogen is, uh, requires much higher pressures and temperatures to uh, transport, and there's problems with embrittlement and all kinds of other things. But right now, uh, ammonia looks like the uh, perfect fit in between. So let, let's talk about this. So I found a technical paper that talks about an ammonia-powered engine, and this was uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. In my travels, I think they say Worcester. In, if this is where I think it is, I think it's in the Northeast of America here, up near Boston and such. Um, this was a very good uh, um, 
overview of the difference between uh, gasoline and ammonia. And uh, one of the things that I ran into back here, a typical gasoline engine operates at uh, 25 to 30 percent efficiency. Typical diesel engine operates around 30 to 35 percent efficiency. Theoretically, ammonia would have an efficiency between 11 and 19 percent, which is uh, which is not great. When you come down here, uh, you learn that ammonia has a much higher octane rating than gasoline. So. Theoretically, it seems to me if you designed for this higher octane, there's a higher internal temperature within the chamber, which creates a greater thermal efficiency and more power produced. So I think in our current engines, uh, some of what I'm reading in here, you can take about 10% ammonia and mix it with your current gasoline, which is, if you think about it, we've been doing that with the dang ethanol, and ethanol degrades your performance substantially because they were trying to get rid of the MTBF. No, what was that stuff called? I can't think about right now, but it was, they were finding that was collecting in the uh, environment. So they had to replace it and that's, they came up with an ethanol to do that. And that caused all kinds of nasty side effects to engines and hoses and all kinds of things. But they're looking at uh, maybe they could replace with this ammonia. Uh, you, I, you can't really mix it with the gasoline, so you would actually have to have an additional tank in your vehicle, an additional pump, and then it could be mixed in. So that's some of the thoughts that they're looking at. But if you designed an engine from scratch and we get the distribution of these, uh, uh, of this fuel, um, it, I mean, the nice thing about it, forget these batteries, which are a pain in the butt, takes all night to charge and everything. Um, you could fill it just like a regular vehicle and in a, a similar amount of time. And uh, uh, I, think, I think that's where they're going with this. I found an article of Oxford University looking to power aircraft with ammonia. And apparently they can adapt their existing fleets rather than having to buy redesigned planes. And the, the reason why they're trying to do this is you get emission free travel. Uh, very quickly. Uh, these things just don't put out uh, the same type of stuff. So you, you end up with a, uh, a, like a pure emission. So I don't know uh, how far they are away from this, but this looks like they're, they're heading down uh, this direction uh, rapidly. I will tell you that there are remain or remain challenges that need to be uh, resolved. And so they're looking at this a number of different ways. So the big thing about uh, fuel is how much does it cost to actually create fuel? So much of our fuel, you, you take like oil, for instance, uh, it's substantially subsidized uh, in these corporations and it's very difficult. You think about where we have to go to get this oil all over the dang world in the deepest parts of the oceans and freezing areas and you gotta pipe it all over the place. Well, apparently, um, the thing about uh, ammonia, green ammonia, is they've come up with uh, a new methodology for creating this fuel that uh, doesn't have to be drilled and everything else. You basically can create it out of a very simple uh, uh, process. So this is the way they've been doing it since 1909 to try to create uh, ammonia, and apparently it's quite uh, energy intensive to do this. So now they're, they've come up with a uh, chemical synthesis using these, uh, it almost looks just like generators, very simple, compact designs. And uh, it, you can uh, generate this stuff using, you know, solar power, wind power, grid, hydro, uh, nuclear, whatever. And it's, uh, it's very simple. Uh, you can store this just like propane, the end product. Uh, uh, and, and I mean, I could see this down the road where this could potentially be something sitting outside my house where my solar is generating this to be able to fuel my car directly and just goes into a tank. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see how that works out. All right. I think I stumbled onto the uh, paper that uh, discusses how these uh, new technology generators work. And it was, uh, let me get to the back back here because this, this goes through a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and then I got to the back and they actually show a picture of this. And boy, this looks awfully similar to what I was showing on the other page. It looks like we have these uh, tubes where they call it a reactor. 
and they're uh, basically bringing in you know air in and uh, fuel to be able to uh, create this uh, ammonia I think it's quite interesting how simple this is another thing to consider is when we run all of this solar and wind and everything especially solar solar is a problem because you only got 12 hours a day right it's uh, uh, and then you have nighttime and then solar doesn't work so they've always been trying to figure out well how do you store the excess that's generated so that you can run at night well they're considering that perhaps uh, ammonia is the way to do it so you generate ammonia and then ammonia could actually be used to fuel vehicles so excess capacity is is then put into stations and then that's used for as another product so anyways there's uh, different things or maybe you run it for your generator for the nighttime type thing so there's there's a lot of different things that they're looking at how this might work and I, I just find this uh, quite interesting so this is just another little update for you and uh, I'm just pleased that uh, I gave us an opportunity at an early entry point and I got a feeling this is going to be big if you can imagine uh, we could have these uh, generators sitting out uh, just, you know, coming right off your house and potentially create your own fuel. Boy, that's disruptive if you ask me. I don't know what this thing will cost, but uh, man, no fuel tax, nothing. This is where they're going to have to go and actually just charge you by the mile when you drive. But uh, anyways, I hope this is interesting to you. I hope everybody's treating you well. I hope you're doing well. Do the best you can. God bless. All right, go party. We gonna go bye bye? Are we gonna go bye bye? Are we gonna go bye bye? Are we gonna go bye bye? <coughs> we gonna go bye, -bye? <coughs> yeah, all right. <coughs> you going to get in the car? We're not quite ready. I'm almost ready. You almost ready? Okay. I tell you, you got to walk all around your property and pay attention to things, but I got tons of blackberries that are ready to be harvested, so I got to go get a little cup and uh, fill these things up. I was just shocked when I walked down here. I go, hey, what's that? So, guess what? I got a little treat right now. Doug Doug has a new toy. Doug Doug has a new toy. Let me see it. <laughs> you got a new toy? He's so happy. It's a little rabbit. Does that make you happy? Whoops. Got a little wag going on, huh? Happy boy.